track these four feelings. I'm sorry to tell you that I, I still remember it when I realized it was four feelings. I too, as a man, looked up to the heavens said, and said to God, you've got to be kidding me. They were right. <laughs> Did you push record? <laughs> Thanks so much for joining us again on Second Act TV. I want to welcome Dr. Gary Sellier back. Gary, thank you so much for joining me again. And thank you for having me back again. Well, Gary, of course, is the author of Safe to Love Again, and we will link to our first two segments. What I want to talk about uh, now, and we, we talked about this off camera, I think is super important and interesting, is relationship conflict amongst couples when you're just, it just isn't working anymore. And again, you losing hope that you can ever be restored. And you bring your, uh, your view of attachment theory into that as well with uh, some great explanations of what is actually happening. So talk, talk to me about that. Well, relationship conflict. Remember earlier I said that the singles will, will pick someone based on whatever feeling they have. Remember, attachment is all about the science, how we are loved, to, wired to love and be loved back. So if they feel unworthy, their brain uses that to pick someone. And if they feel disempowered, then they'll find someone who gives them that feeling. So imagine what happens <clears throat> after these feelings that we chose them for keep rolling. <laughs> Frustration sets out. And then we all start off with relationships. Oh, they'll change. Or, you know, we build in a false hope. Now, with all couples that I've dealt with, because I deal with couples too, <clears throat> I call it dueling rights or dueling feelings, missing feelings, right? Like with one couple, she she grew up alcoholic family, never had a right to belong. I got that when I grew up in one of those two, right? So she was kind of always trying to knock on the door. I want to belong. I want to belong. I want to we, right? But she didn't have it. And her brain picked two people that really were abusive. So she does the work, and she finds a, a high school sweetheart, uh, not a high school sweetheart, but a friend, and he was just coming out of. A 26 year marriage. Now, her missing feeling that she had never had and didn't have a right for was, I can't feel cherished. I can't belong. His feeling on the other was disempowered. That's what he had been given. Uh, he didn't have any right to what I call create his own experience. What's that look like? In a marriage of 26 years, this man never initiated sex. That's fairly disempowered for a guy. We'll yeah, just kind of grant you that, right? Um, uh, uh, almost to the place where you almost, when he said it, I, I actually had to have him repeat it <clears throat> because I didn't know if I heard it right, right? Now, that went track back to childhood when a very domineering dad didn't give him any uh, right to have any sense of personal power, right? Now, when they get together, so his, his brain is selecting for some way to be disempowered. So the day comes when the ex-wife and the, and the children Say, we don't want to have the new one come over for Christmas. Hmm. So he has no right to create his own experience. He's always feeling disempowered. He says, well, okay, I got to make everybody happy, so I'll come over. And he tells her, oh, we won't be together for the holidays. Uh, we can meet afterwards. What's this hit in her? Not cherished, right? And no belonging, the old wound. This is how it rolls. And then she comes after him, just totally, you know, criticizes him. What's he get? An old feeling of disempowered. And now they're cycling downwards. What do, who did I get engaged to? When we gave him back a right, so it was safe to feel empowered. <clears throat> he could create his own experience. He could set a boundary. He could say to her, nope, this is the woman I love. And this is how we're going to do it. When she felt included, oh my God, she felt cherished. We gave her back a right to feel cherished. She takes that and then she empowers him. What's that look like? He lost a job. She was a very well-connected, uh, uh, successful woman. And within a month, got him, got him another six-figure job. Now there's powering and cherishing instead of disempowering. All couples 
their brain is contracted for exactly the 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 experience they have the what I call the rights for the change. But if you change these feelings, then they do better. What most couples are arguing about isn't the issue. It's the feelings underneath the issue. I don't feel worthy, welcome, cherished or empowered. So if you're in a relationship, uh, one to ten, how cherished do you? I mean, how welcome do you feel? One to ten, how worthy do you feel? One to ten, how cherished, how much of a me that's valued and a we, and how empowered. Anything under a seven or an eight, you've got to work on. If two, of, one of those is missing, you're thinking, gosh, we could use a little work. Two, you're thinking, what's the name of a good therapist or a good coach? And three or four missing, you're in a toxic relationship. Mm -hmm. the, so what I tell couples, I have them do a check-in every week that the ones work on, <clears throat> check-in, scale of, of one to 10, how did I do as your spouse? Well, if you get anything under a nine, then you say, okay, which feeling was missing? And then what gave it to them? <clears throat> now you're using your range natural correction. Oh, well, I didn't feel very welcomed with joy, honey. When I walked in the room at three nights this week and you were looking at your cell phone and you didn't even look up. Bingo. Now you know what to, now you know what to work on. <laughs> or honey, you know. I love the fact that you got me the the whole vase of purple irises, but uh, you know, I just wondered if you knew that I always love yellow. No, very interesting. It, what what popped in my head too as you were talking is that there, you know, I think in your book you say that the brain, that experience isn't really what actually happened, but how your brain perceived it, and that's why we have the the power to re rewire our brain to be able to get past this. Is, am I saying that correctly? Yeah, I mean, what I, I think the most powerful question is your brain creates an experience. It is not the same as reality. People say, well, my truth is, well, yes, it's your truth, but it doesn't mean it's the truth. Brains are experience generating machines. They're like a hollow deck to use Star Trek <laughs> in our heads. Uh, the best example, is what I, uh, in chapter one, Paul in the book. He comes to me, he's anxiously attached, and he's his phrase that he comes up with is, when does love turn against me? That's the operational. And in two 10-year marriages, he was always waiting for, when does love turn against me? Not so much leave, but turn against me. And two women got tired of being mistrusted and divorced him, and he goes, see, I told you you would turn against me. <laughs> That's how you can prod things. Well, it turns out that when he was four, he had a, two parents that were world-class, secure parents. They were wonderful parents. Two, an older brother and sister with long-term marriages, secure love styles to match it. But he was anxious, and, you know, and the day came at four, we tracked it back to a, one instant, where his, they were at a campfire scene. And for some reason, his father turned against him, grabbed him and beat on him for no good reason. It never happened before, it never happened again. But after that, the brain was looking for betrayal. When does love turn against me? Even though it happened only one time mm -hmm. to a four-year-old. That's the experience he tells her. Now, a few months later, he's still working with me. I'm having a workshop. And his older brother comes as a support, stand, sitting right beside on the front row. And he gets up and shares this story in the afternoon. And I am watching his brother's jaw drop to the ground. And I'm going, wow, that is an interesting re response from the brother. And then he, he breaks in and he says, Paul, that, that's why you're screwed up? He says, that's why you're 12, you're, you're twice. He says, oh, my God, you got it so wrong. He says, I was nine, you were four. You got too close to the campfire and your pants legs caught on fire. Dad wasn't turning against you. He wasn't beating you. He was making sure you weren't turned into a marshmallow. <laughs> but the brain made an experience of it. Four-year-olds. Believing in tooth fairies, not so logical, not always the most aware, doesn't notice the pant legs on fire, right? So in 
even in couples, there is always distortion. <laughs> you know, if you're dealing if you're dealing with a couple, you know, Sire's first law is you don't believe the first thing either of them tell you. <laughs> you they don't. You know, nobody says, you know, uh, I, I, I've been a jerk and no wonder she's been really rude to me. <laughs> they don't come in and they just don't do that. Right. Uh, they come in and go, can you believe that? Right. And what they're doing is recreating that. The, the thing is, is to realize your brain has created experience with rules and strategies. And the key thing is when people get stuck in personal transformation, they get into what I call, you know, like therapy loops. Why did I do it? Why do I do it? Why is the dog chasing its tail? Mm -hmm. How did my brain create that is the winning ticket. If you can say, how are we as a couple creating this experience and why are they like that? <laughs> you know, if we can get the couple to become a team against the pattern and notice how they're creating the pattern, now they can do something to change it. But why? Well, why is because they're a jerk. Why is because they're, you know, they're narcissists or borderline or whatever. You know, all those may very well have some truth to them, you know, running mommy issues and all those other stuff. But if they can notice, oh, this is what I'm doing. Yeah, no, it's 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 fascinating, and and as I said on our uh, one of our other segments, you know, as we talk, it's really about becoming aware of this. You know that we we just had no idea that to even think about that 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 these attachment theories, these styles, that this is what's influencing us, and to think, you know, how, how early on in life this happens when nobody really could do anything about it. Everything is misinterpreted. It, it, it does tend to get convoluted, but to have the awareness of it, I think just really empowers us to find the answer and fix and fix it. And I know you go into this, you know, a lot in, in your book, which we'll link to. And how, how would you close this out? Uh, no, yeah. I want to let everybody know it's these four feelings. And I, I want to say something to the men who will be listening to this, <clears throat> you know, it's I know you were told you couldn't have your feelings and the whole male sexual you have them they're running you just aren't aware of them <clears throat> and to have a really good relationship with the world women naturally ping the world with emotional radar they want to and so they're always asking us how are you feeling and if we say well I you know I feel that the day didn't go the way no feelings are words like depressed you know anxious fearful anger hopeless those things so imagine it's not only do you have these feelings and you have a right to have these as a man, but for you to have a happy marriage, you have to ping her back with an actual emotion word. It's and so when we give them stories or we say, oh, it was fine. They don't their radar screens went blank. We they don't know where we're at. And they if they don't know where they're at, we make them anxious. It's like. You know, when we like in airports, they send out radar and the radar bounces off the plane. And then the, the air traffic controller knows that Delta 476 is coming in here and there's a United over here. But if they suddenly stopped sending signals back and they disappeared, I guarantee you, you're going to have some very, very anxious air traffic controllers. This is what we men do when we're not in touch with our feelings to our spouses. We are t turning off their radar and they don't know where they're in a relationship. They don't know how to track us. And, and we are the ones driving them to the anxiety <clears throat> and the disappointment. All we have to do is spend five minutes telling our women, this is how I feel. And importantly enough, find out how she feels. Track these four feelings, I'm sorry to tell you, that I, I still remember it when I realized it was four feelings. I, too, as a man, looked up to the heavens said, and said to God, you've got to be kidding me. They were right. <laughs> you know, and I, I literally did. It was like, oh, you know, what about logic? It's not logic. It's feelings. It's logical to go with what the brain uses versus what we say it wants to because it doesn't. Give these feelings receive these feelings, track them like they're the lifeblood of a relationship. If you can make each other feel welcomed and worthy and cherished and empowered, <clears throat> you will feel loved. It's, it's doable work. Gary, and on that note, we will link to all of your information, to your book, to your website. And uh, thank you so much for sitting down talking with us. And I hope to see you again soon on Second Act TV.
Thank you. It's been an honor, Silva. If you haven't done so already, please be sure to subscribe to our channel. The button is right over here. Just click on through to YouTube. And when you see the little bell right next to the subscribe button, hit that too. We'll notify you every time we launch a new video. See you next time.